I have the good fortune to be at the home of Clyde Arbuckle and his good wife Helen at 988 to Franquette in San Jose. Clyde is an eminent historian, an old timer from an old time family, and Clyde, we so appreciate your willingness to meet with us today and be interviewed. I wondered if you could perhaps start by telling us something of the Arbuckle family, your parents, where they came from, when they came to this area, and what they did. Could you do that? Um, in the first place, uh, the uh, Gordons, my mother's people, preceded the Arbuckles. My father, to the best of my knowledge, got up to San Jose, I should say about 1892. He, he registered to vote that year. And then he was listed first as a laborer, then as a farmer. Uh, my, uh, I can remember my father, well, I was a pretty good sized lad when he died. Not, not a, but um, my, my mother was born in San Jose. You know, we get the two together. My mother was born in San Jose December 1st, 1858. My father was a little older. He was born in Indiana in 1849. Uh, my mother's people uh, were Virginians, North Carolinians, and East Tennesseans with a Kentucky or two thrown in. Uh, they started moving westward very earlier, before long before the Arbuckles did. And in 1846, they came overland to California, and the Gordons, the Lairds, the Piles, all my mother's people, settled in Santa Clara County. My father uh, came westward from his birthplace in Indiana as far as Smith Center, Kansas. And there he took up land and farmed there for a while. There, my Arbuckle brothers were born. Uh, Roscoe, the one me that people today call Fatty Arbuckle, he was my half-brother. And then Arthur and Harry, my sister Nora and Lola. Uh, my sister Nora, I think, was born in Indiana. The Arbuckles were not so good as the Gordons in keeping family records, and I have difficulty getting it all today. But it is proven, documented, and my Helen's witnessed it with me, that the Arbuckle, James Arbuckle, was in Virginia in 1749. So, so much for that. But uh, the, uh, my father came out to Los Angeles during the 1880s, uh, during the big rush when the railroads were competing. Uh, he uh, settled finally at Santa Ana in Orange County. There, his first wife died. Uh, she didn't, uh, he stayed there only a short time after her death. What he was her name, Clyde? Hmm? What was his first wife's name? Uh, that, I don't know her first name. Uh, the, uh, that uh, my sister had never given me. Norma, my sister Nora, who became Nora St. John, the mother of Al St. John, the Max Senate comedian. Uh, but I, uh, as I say, I have been difficulty getting material on the Arbuckles. I did have a, a, a genealogist write from Fruita, Colorado here some years ago, and he told me that I was a descendant, no, I've never heard my people say it, of uh, Brigadier General Matthew Arbuckle, who founded Fort Smith, Arkansas, and Fort Arbuckle, Oklahoma. Uh, they weren't real forts, they were more army posts than a fort. Uh, that I checked up uh, uh, the General Arbuckle's record. There was nothing spectacular about it. Uh, I didn't find out whether he was a hero or but he came on up through the, uh, the, the I suppose, the, uh, I don't know whether he came up from the ranks or, or whether he was an officer uh, to start in the Army. They, uh, so anyway, he, uh, and I don't have the Arbuckle family Bible, except my mother's uh, Bible from her first, as the first marriage. Well, uh, anyhow, uh, when after his first uh, wife died, my father decided to come north. Um, he didn't like Orange County, and she didn't wish to come north at, at that time. So that was it. My sister, Nora, my eldest sister, Nora Arbuckle, uh, stayed in Southern California. She married a man named Walter St. John there in state. Uh, my uh, brother Arthur, my eldest brother, an engineer, uh, came northward. Uh, and then uh, my next eldest uh, uh, brother, Harry, uh, William Harrison Arbuckle. He also came north, but I married a half-sister of mine by my mother's first marriage, Nellie Arbuckle, uh, Nellie Gordon. And then he moved to Fresno and brought up a large family there. 
they, they're all dead now. And go, I'm the last of the Arbuckles in my generation. And my sisters are gone. And uh, my mother's on my th mother's side. I'm a Gordon. I, well, my mother was born Molly E. Gordon in Santa Fe, December 1st, 1858. Uh, and then uh, she married the first time a man named Joseph Gordon. So far as we know, no relation. Uh, similar names, yes. And if he did by chance happen to be a relative, it wasn't close enough to create any genetic problems. Uh, at least I hope so. But uh, anyhow, the uh, <coughs> mother first went to live. She was born in Santa Fe, that's right. And her first husband had a tan bark stand in Mendocino County. Uh, tan bark was a very important product in those days. It was used for tanning leather. The Eberhard Tanning Company tanning tan bark sheds were standing for many years after the uh, the uh, had tannery ceased work. That's now the property of the University of Santa Clara. But uh, the uh, mother's husband harvested tan bark from the tan oak tree and shipped it down to the settlements uh, to do the tannery. The bark of that particular oak tree, the dendrosus tell us it's not a genuine oak, it's more, it's a member of the oak family, the family phagocyte. They, uh, they tell us that, uh, that uh, that was the chief tanning agent. And uh, maybe, Austin, you can hear, as you went by the tannery when you were a boy, you hear something make a grinding noise in there, you could hear clear across to St. Clair's Church very easily. And there was one man, big German fellow, who just tossed those logs of tan bark into that tanning machine, uh, that grinding machine. Then that, that stuff was taken and put into vats and mixed with water, and in time it gave off the tannin. It was removed and, it, and the, it, it made the solution help with water with the solution. And the cowhides with the hair scraped off them were uh, put into that and permitted to cure, as they said. Well, that, that's one way we got our leather. So mother, Huffman supplied that from Mendocino County, because they're in Northern Illinois and in Humboldt County, and perhaps the largest stands of tan bark. Our own Santa Cruz Mountains down here had a large tan bark. And every boy, every kid in Santa Clara, up to the time at Everhart, went over to the chemical industry in, ta in tanning. I can remember uh, the wagons coming down from the mountains with Bell, Bell teams, mules and coming down Saratoga Avenue in Bellamy Street, down to Grant Street, now known as the Alameda, and up to Everhart Tanner. And we can see those wagons bringing the tan bark in every season. And they piled it high there by the buildings, didn't they? Mm -hmm. They piled the tan oak yes. bark well, high. The, the tan oak had been peeled from the oak limbs. Mm -hmm. The wood was not in there. The wood could be sold for firewood. But the, the tan, uh, the, the oak tree was felled with the foliage down. Then the men got in there and cut off the limbs anywhere from uh, anywhere from a couple of inches in diameter up to maybe six or eight or ten inches in diameter. And they cut or made two cuts about four feet apart, the same length as cordwood, and then split it down that, then pried the uh, off. The reason the tree was felled uh, with the uh, foliage down on the hillside, they kept the sap in there just so they, they could peel the bark off easily. And the, the bark looked like cordwood as it was being hauled in the wagons. So that was my mother, that, that my mother's first husband. He died in 1898. And leaving mother with seven children. Uh, she had eight children by him. And one of them, a girl uh, died, named Grace, uh, died about, uh, I believe her, I'd have to get the family Bible, but I believe her, her death was about 18, 78, uh, not 78, but 88, and along in there. But uh, then, uh, after her first husband's death, mother came down to Santa Fe and went up to my grandfather's ranch above Milpitas. Uh, she stayed up there for a while, and there she met my father. My father came up there. Uh, one uh, Harry, one of my brothers, said he was looking for land. And another account, I believe his own account, he was looking for employment at the moment. But in any event, he met my mother there. And there he was with several children. Here's my mother with several children. And they married in 90, uh, 
in about uh, 99 or 1900. And uh, my first, uh, uh, my only full brother was born January the 1st, 1901, Glenn Arbuckle. And he was uh, the first baby born in this county in the new century, and that's on record as a county recorder's office. My mother should have been a lawyer. She kept her record, I could make a record, but it wasn't yet compulsory. The law of 1905 hadn't been passed. And uh, at that time, that's what took care of death and all, all the vital statistics. So mother, the, um, uh, Glenn was the first. He died when he was 19 months old of scarlet fever. And then I came along on April 11th, 1903. So Were you I, born at home? I was born at home, 445 Jackson Street. So that was it. Uh, Dr. Fowler uh, ushered me into the world. I That's George say. Washington Fowler. George Washington Fowler. Mother did, uh, uh, did attend Dr. Paul on one or two occasions, but uh, she met him on the street one day. Uh, as I said, indicated by mother being a recording the birth of her children, and recording anything important. And she met Dr. Paul on the street, walked right by the old fellow's hall, and mother was wheeling me along and says, Oh, Dr. Paul, how are you this morning? And he, he exchanged a few pleasantries before a car got there. And he said, Well, I'll have to go over to the courthouse. Well, we're equal to the decision. She said, oh, if you're going there, would you mind stepping into the recorder's office and recording the birth of my baby? And that was you. <laughs> and it's all there. I've got my birth certificate, copies of my birth certificates here. And that was Dr. Judson Paul, mm -hmm. whose Dr. home was Judson, on Benson yes. Street, yes. Uh, that's how Walter Paul, J.W. Paul, that's how Walter Paul got his name. You remember the elder son? And then there was Donald Paul. Yeah, I think you probably knew better than Walter. Walter and I worked in Block Fruit Company together. But, so that was it. And Dr. Paul did that for my mother. And he, uh, I thought that was a lot of girls. <laughs> but uh, anyway, George Washington Fowler was, the, uh, was our family physician. And the, uh, uh, he looked after me quite carefully. I'll, I'll interject a story here. Uh, I, in 1930, I was going to school in San Francisco, working here eight hours a day, and commuting to an affiliated school in San Francisco. California School of Fine Arts. And then five nights a week. Then I was hitting the parties on the weekends. Well, one day I got a few flutters on my innards. And good boy, I got a heart attack or something. And I got some more. I don't know what I eat and I And I went up to see Dr. Fowler. And he <laughs> uh, looked me over and said, there's nothing the matter with you. What have you been doing? And I told him. He said, you haven't been getting enough sleep and I go and beat it. <laughs> All right. All right, then, I, then later on, I had a second one, uh, one of the friends, but I didn't go back. And at length, uh, I had one or two more, and uh, I went back to see Dr. Farr. So this time, he gave me a going over with such apparatus as he had there. And <clears throat> I said, well, what are you doing? I'm telling him what I told him what I've been doing. <coughs> he says, I thought I told you to get some sleep. Well. My weight was going down. I think I got down into the top 60s, 160, when I should have been up about 175. And he, so uh, he gave me a blood test in the little, um, what is it, centrifugal force machine when it when starts flying, the, the test, the urine test, and everything else. So then he walked out to the staircase with me, remember, he had the Frank Hall. Yeah, the original, original library was up there, in the front, right over Menzel Hardware. And the doctor- On Franklin Street, that was on Franklin yeah, Street. Yeah, on the north side between Washington and Maine. Mm -hmm. And the doctor walked out the edge of the short and he put, pointed down there, now you may have to censor this word. He says, look, there's not one damn thing wrong with you. If I see you come up those stairs again, I'm going to kick your ass down them. <laughs> that was the doctor who me. Now I, I, I keep <laughs> Uh, Did he say it in his usual voice? Mm -hmm. Did he say it in his usual voice? Yes. Uh, Dr. Fowler, by the way, had a, when he whispered, you could hear him from here in San Mateo. <laughs> uh, well, he was a, my Aunt Maddie had gone over kids, uh, with, well, my grandfather owned a lot of land in Everbury, too. 
and they went to the school, uh, the old Highland School up there, up by the Coal Ranch. I think the Coal's on the building uh, for a long time. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, so much for that. So my father and mother were married. My father operated a restaurant in Santa Clara. Uh, you know where Barsulia's restaurant was? That was the restaurant my father, the Santa Clara restaurant. And he had been in business there. Mother did a lot of the cooking. My uh, two of my Gordon half brothers worked in there, Charlie, and uh, I guess Frank worked for a little while. Maybe Harry worked for a little while. And then Roscoe, the one you call Fatty, he worked in it. And that's where he uh, developed his skill with flapjacks. And my father's a restaurant. Uh, my, uh, uh, Roscoe also pulled a quick one with Fred Zipperline. Uh, the old shoemaker right across the street. The man had a shoe that big in his front window next to Salas and Rhodes' his grocery. It later became uh, Salas and Rourke, Pat Rourke. And then Furtado took over Wyman's barber shop in between there. Um, uh, what was the uh, the, the Campo, uh, Campo? There was a Spanish, a Spanish gentleman that had that barber shop in the latter, latter years. Uh, but uh, they, there they were. Uh, the, uh, working in the restaurant. Then uh, that was a good adventure. And then my, my father just gave it up. He wasn't born to be a businessman. He was a farmer. My mother's people were ranchers, they, you, as you may gather from their hill country. Uh, the, uh, so uh, the, uh, <coughs> my father uh, died. He was down to Los Angeles. He was a bit visiting Roscoe down there, and he died down there. I was, well, I was almost 12 years old, I guess. My mother was left a widow twice with a house full of some grown and some growing, still growing children. And I never heard her complain. She had two driving urges. One, to keep out of debt. Two, to keep her kids out of San Quentin. Mm. And if a more park cost switch would affect the latter, she didn't hesitate to use it. So, mother, but then mother died in 32, uh, July 7th, uh, sorry, July 31st, uh, 1932. Uh, the, uh, How was it that Roscoe uh, got into the movie Roscoe, uh, when he was working here, he'd worked for my dad on the hay press. Uh, Roscoe played hooky from school, time and again. Finally, my father said, my father did own a hay press. He, I didn't like to mention that. He got a hay press. And Roscoe worked on the press. Why? Because he played hooky for my school. My father was tough. I've heard my mother say. And I've heard my sister Nell, Nell born Nellie Gordon, who married my brother Harry, Arb Harry Arbuckle. I heard him say that my dad was pretty hard on him. My dad was strict. Uh, so um, he, uh, I did, oh, Roscoe, uh, when Roscoe played hooky for school, then my father, and I'll put you to work. And that was a custom. You call it custodian advice if you wish. But my dad put him to work on the hay press. And Roscoe then, who I heard my half brother Charlie Gordon, uh, who died in 1943, I believe. He, uh, he said, no, 38, my sister Dean died in 1943. Uh, but uh, oh, that's on the Gordon side. But I heard uh, Charlie say that Roscoe weighed almost 300 pounds then. Mm. And he was a lighter on his feet as could be. But Roscoe could sing. He had a, a tenor voice. What kind of te tenor was it? They, uh, they were, uh, there was a contra tenor uh, where the, the, the Roscoe could take up where the ordinary tenor left off and hit the high notes. And he used to go to amateur nights in, in, um, in a theater in San Jose, the Unique, founded by Sid Roman. In 1903, Sid Grauman introduced movies into San Jose. Mm -hmm. And Roscoe, then he had uh, stock shows coming through, such as Ed Redmond used to have. And he put on his own shows. But he had an amateur night. And the uh, Roscoe used to sing on amateur night. And the, uh, I think the favorite one, they said, brought down the house. Now, that's only hearsay. I can't prove that. Uh, they brought down the house was the Holy City. It was, it was something for the tenors, and they went way up. And then uh, prior to, he alternated that uh, with a bop boy, 
uh, as a mop boy at some uh, pub uh, saloon. Uh, he, got a, he got any kind of job that a kid could uh, get what he was. And at that time he was, I think, what, 80, 89, 20? Well, he was uh, now going on 20 years old, you know, either a, little, a little older maybe. And the, uh, he, uh, <coughs> he, he went on the stage. He was on the stage one night when Ferris Hartman Company came through. They were a road show, a stock show, and they traveled all over the West and other parts of the United States. And Hartman heard Roscoe sing. And he picked him up like that. So Roscoe was illegitimate. I've got his, uh, he was with Ferris Hartman when he got married in 1908. He was married on the stage in Long Beach. And his, uh, his widow, uh, well, I was a beneficiary of her, his widow's will. Uh, through her insurance policy here only about two years ago. Mm. Uh, but he, she was an actress and he was, a, I'll, I'll show you the scrapbook sometime. I, I, I can fish it out in a hurry and let you see where, and there's a picture of him being married on the stage. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Roscoe stayed on the stage and he was in Japan in 1918, the year of the big flu epidemic. And he, uh, he, uh, he got, they called it the grip. I believe mean, it was comparable to our Spanish flu, or as we termed it. But anyway, he lost his voice temporarily. Well, it just happened that some experience he'd had when put him in, in down in Southern California with Sid, uh, was Mac Sennett. And Mac took him for a comedian in the, in the picture, Roscoe's pictures, Fatty Armour. It was Max Sennett, I guess, who gave him that. We never called him Fatty, or never, oh, what's the wild, my half brother Charlie Gordon say, Fat Hour Book or something like that. But that's about all, it was always Roscoe he was. So um, he, went out, he went with Max Sennett, you know, it was Keystone Comedy. Then in 1921, he got into that mess in San Francisco. I was up there in the Uri. You wouldn't remember the Santa Clara the Valley Aero Squadron, would you? It's a Western Aero Club. Uh, do, they, do they have one out there on the El Camino uh, out yes, by uh, uh, that, that was the, the block place? Club and I worked for it. Yeah, that I was where I, I learned about airplane engines first. I can rig and fit any, any biplane you've ever seen. And, uh, and they can set the valves on the engine near it. They taught me all that. Never, never paid me a cent. I worked for a year and a half, but I did have it. Then here in San Jose, uh, we used to have the 100% uh, industrial expedition, and they would uh, uh, have an air circus. And the stump flyers would come from all over the country, out there south. Where they, well, now it's uh, it would be on South Fourth Street, about where Alma Cross, about where Spartan Stadium is, and along the railroad tracks. It, with the airfield, they landed in the beet field. But uh, anyhow, the, uh, we organized a club here with Johnny Johnson as our first commandant. There were 25 of us. Now, I didn't know it, I didn't pay attention to it until the last 20 years because there, uh, Eugene Sawyer, in his history of Santa Clara County, published in 1822, wrote up the Western Aero Club. And I hadn't gotten into the history by any professional way or any other way then. I was more interested in my bike than anything else, and then the airplane sector. Well, uh, I, my name is listed by Sawyer. I was one of the 20. That's in his 1922 book. Yeah. 1922, that big book, the big right, book. Right, right. You'll find it in the, the chapter on organizations, and I think the Western Aero Club is about that. That's, well, anyway, Pennington Todd went broke, and that ended my search. I was in one airplane crack up on the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, we got an order uh, that we flew for carnivals, mm -hmm. and they want a, a man named Horstman, who operated carnivals up and down California, uh, came to us and wanted us to uh, fly, carrying passengers, at uh, Pismo Beach to a big carnival going on there. Our pilot, the only pilot who could get away, uh, was Justin Dyke, a son-in-law of Fred Sherman on the home center, a red-headed man, very devout man. All right. Well, Dyke was flying. I was sent down as a mechanic and rigger and 
gasser and the oiler and the valve setter and all that sort of thing. All right. Now, the dike, instead of flying all the way, we left Santa uh, Clara about, uh, I'd say about uh, 3.30. And uh, in June, we could have gone all the way to Bismo. But Dyke had to visit his mother at, uh, out on Lighthouse Avenue in Pacific Grove. Now, that was all right. But why in the Dickens didn't he land at the polo field at Del Monte? Where Omar Locklear, the first man to jump from airplane to airplane uh, in midair, was, uh, was based, putting on his show. But no, Dyke didn't do that. He wanted to land out of Rocky Point. And if Dyke had a field of 5,000 acres, I'm absolutely clear, and there's one big rock about as high as uh, that chair over there, the, uh, stick, uh, protruding from the ground, he'd hit the rock. <laughs> but yet, I was in the plane, same ship with him when we took off at uh, Tascadero and took off at Templeton. And he just wingtips touched the oak trees and he went right up. Mm -hmm. After we came, we came back and uh, in this uh, crack up, I, I, I got ahead of myself, in this crack up at Pacific Grove, uh, he tore off the lower left wing, the undercarriage, and wrecked the prop. The prop threw wood. He didn't put any strain on the frank crankshaft at all. All right, so that was uh, that was all right. Uh, the uh, so I had to come back to Santa Fe that night. I was going to come by uh, by train from Pacific Grove to Salinas, then I make a connection with a limited train and got to Santa Fe at seven o'clock in the morning. But I had to wait till nine o'clock to get out of Paso Robles, out of uh, Monterey. And whom should I meet but Bert Quilly? Santa Fe businessman whom I knew well, and uh, the, uh, an insurance man, maybe you, you've seen the name, it's quite a prominent name. And Bert said, hey, what are you doing down here, Arbuckle? And I told him what had happened. I said, I'm waiting for a train. He said, what are you, what are you doing? I said, well, I'll have to go home to get a wing. And uh, 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 Brad Dyke had already telephoned. So we, uh, uh, Dyke, uh, uh, I went, I went to, out to the uh, airfield, at, uh, out on the clay and San Francisco Road, right at the turn on Albertson's right. property. Albertson leased the land to him. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I went out there and we took a wing off the remaining ship and we took the undercarriage, took the wheels off it and put it on the bumper of the Phoenix Stevens 76 automobile. That noisy over. One of our students was Bill Clayton, now the, now the late Bill Clayton, and Bill died about, I guess, about two years ago, two and a half years ago. And Willis Clayton, son of uh, Willis Clayton, Willis Clayton Jr., son of Willis Clayton, the banker. All right, so uh, we went out there and we got uh, the material. And we, had, we, tied the, uh, we tied the panel, we put braces on top, and tied the panel, the lower left, that's the, what you call the, the lower panel of the, lower, of the left wing on top we so the the car and then the start and tie and the prop we tied to the door handles on one side and then took it down to uh, and we, we took it down the, to Pacific Grove to Pacific Grove and yeah. restored the plane out of the field yeah. and then you we were also out. involved with a lot of bicycling at that time weren't you but mm -hmm. well, you were involved with bicycling at about oh, that yes, time yes I started bike uh, bike racing in 1917. And the one, the man who got me started is still alive, Bill Plummer. Will, really? Will. Yeah. He's living in Washington. And I saw Mrs. Tiffany, his sister, uh, Helen. You know, he had two sisters, Helen and Ruth. And I was in, grand, in well, I was in school with both of them. Well, she married Dr. Tiffany with Tiffany yes, Center's yes, name. Yes, she married Dr. Tiffany out there on Lexington Street, on the opposite side of the street, I believe, from where you lived for a while. I think you said you were born there, wasn't it? On Lexington, right. Yeah, uh, in the 1600 block. All right. The, uh, the uh, Bill Plummer uh, was carrying the Mercury for Fred Alderman. Uh, he had a nice Pierce racing bike, and I thought that bike was some, some pumpkins. So uh, uh, I did, uh, my, brother, my brother Frank, had, uh, half brother, had given me a big heavy bike. Uh, it wasn't a racing bike, but uh, I had a bike. Frank, uh, Frank rode it for a while, but he preferred, preferred his horses. Frank earned his living breaking saddle horses. Uh, so uh, he died in 1918. 
during the flu epidemic. But anyway, I had the bike. And uh, one day, uh, uh, Bill, Bill Plummer let me ride his bike. It was Kelly Handlebar's the kind of came up and down the Justable Headway. Oh, I was in the seventh heaven, boy, and that, that was something. And then uh, the, in 1917, uh, the Gilroy Wreath was coming on, on Decoration Day, or Memorial Day, as we call it today. And they did a 60 mile race. Well, I was riding a 14 mile, uh, 14 mile um, paper route there. I, I'd go get my papers down at the SP depot. The Mercury would be tossed off the train there. Bill Maloney, Jack O'Neill, Tad Gabriel, we were all carrying papers together. We all carried those papers. And we'd roll them up in those days. They didn't box them as they do today. And if any dog came after, we'd take one of the roll of papers and knock the dog Valley West. Just for that. We got so we could throw the paper and make it almost go into a man's mailbox. And I got acquainted that way with old A.R. Woodhams, a pioneer of 1852. I got, I got acquainted with Bradbury, with Sherman's, with Barnhart's, with Lookenboss. Remember Marcy Lookenboss? Sure do. And Archie Lookenboss. And just, I got acquainted with all those people around the Pomeroy's, Marshall and Irwin Pomeroy. Where were you living at that time? Uh, at that time, 1917, I was living at 753 Poplar, well, right overlooking the Al Silva's uh, alfalfa field. He had 30 acres of alfalfa. Well, that's near where Maloney was killed in the air crash. Where? Where yeah, Maloney yeah, was right. killed in the air crash. Yeah, yeah that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, it was bounded on the west by Bascom Avenue, on the east by Union Avenue, now known as Park Avenue, on the south by Poplar Street, and on the uh, south, I mean on the uh, uh, north by Poplar Street, and on the south by one prune orchard, and then an open piece of property had an adobe house on it, known as the Phelps property. Uh, Jim Dempsey, the father of Judge Dempsey uh, had a hay press working out there. And we used to go out there. There was enough hay out there to make it worthwhile to have a stop. And that's where then my father had a hay press. And he, I don't know whom he sold it to. And then Jim Dempsey and a cousin of mine had, had a uh, hay press. But we kids watched for the hay presses. They'd, they'd spot out the field, and there was a cook wagon. I would get away from the bike racing just a moment. Uh, this was a horrendous experience. Uh, there was a cook wagon out there. We'd run out there about 9 o'clock in the morning, and the men had finished eating their cookies, give us kids the donuts or cookies. We'd go out there again in the afternoon. All of that was living. That was great stuff. Yeah, and Mrs. Theriot, or Theriot, capital T H E R I O T, it's a French name, had a son uh, who was George, who was a school principal in Oakland. Uh, we'd see George walking from the SP Depot home to visit his mother on weekends. He never married. Uh, the, uh, but anyway, Mrs. Herod had goats. And she had a nanny, a billy goat that was meaner than all get out. Well, uh, I went out to say that my eye was on the cook, and Manal Lima was on the power of the hay press. My brother, half brother, Harry Gordon, was up on the derrick on the stack. Well, he was driving derrick, the horse down here, which pulled a Jackson fork up, loaded with hay and dropped it right there in front of the press. Then there were two men on each side feeding the press. And then my half-brother, uh, Charlie Gordon, was aware. Uh, for the, and a bale of hay weighed 280 pounds. It's none of this little station wagon stuff that we have today. And then Mina, uh, Lima would stand right out on the beam of that power and whip up that team of horses and around they go. Had a monarch hay press. They also had Petaluma hay press. I'd say, let me, he'd say, uh, Mr. Silva, sometime when you think about it, if you have time to come back, I'll dig out some hay press pictures from the uh, New Peters area and pictures of the Leduc family. And I'd like, maybe you could help me identify them. So much for that. Now, uh, I, I was uh, doing very well, uh, uh, making toward the cookhouse, and out came that big billy goat. Right around the second, gee, he came for me. Um, uh, Lima, and now Lima was out there riding on the beam. The horse room. He jumped down in there and came after that goat. <laughs> oh, that, if I didn't reach 10,000, we changed my sanity. I'll never forget you know, that. I'll never forget that. That was an experience. Hmm? That was an experience for yeah, you. Yeah, that was. Well, quite uh, a couple of things to catch up, and then we want to move along and with our uh, story, yeah. too. Um, uh, your half-brother, Roscoe, mm -hmm. died 
about when? 1933. 1933. We were married and went down to, we had to go down to Los Angeles. My sister wanted to come down. She was uh, uh, looking for the letters of administration or executive. And coming back to you, I know that you were active both with the airplanes and with bicycling, mm -hmm. but when did you meet Helen? When I meet Roscoe? No, Helen, your wife. Oh, when did Helen. you meet Helen? Well, the first time I saw Helen, uh, I think she was in high school, uh, and she was over at uh, the house of a people named Francis, who had two sons that I paled around. Uh, they, our gang, we called it. Uh, and uh, I went over to the, get a, you see both Andy and Joseph Francis, uh, that Francis family, there were, uh, there was a, uh, another boy there too, and then there were a couple of sisters. And so um, I walked past, the, we were walking down the hallway, and I looked off the room, and here were Joe Francis' sister and uh, Helen doing homework there together. Helen lived uh, only a couple blocks away, three blocks away, and they were in high school at the same time. I wonder who that little butterball was, and that was all. <laughs> that's what I said. And that's just what I said to, 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 to Joe. All right. Well, then I, I knew Helen. Uh, they, 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 I'd see her from time to time. And uh, one time, the, uh, uh, well, we, we had met a time or two. I think we met at the Wild Gardens one time in Capitola, didn't we, Mama? You were over there to dance, and I was over there to dance. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, just occasionally we, we could nod or pass the time of day. No. Uh, one night, Ted Venegas, you remember him? Jack Venegas was a painter. Ted and I were in Sonosaurus, and we were walking down First Street, and we passed the Masada Hall, and it was a nice uh, evening, and the windows uh, were open, and the, we heard the music. And uh, Ted said, what do you say we go up? They, they, they were advertising the public dance. Well, we went up there, and Helen was there. So uh, that was it, and we danced and danced, and Helen said, I shouldn't really, really, I don't think I should be here. She had some examinations at school or something coming up. I, this was later on. She was in in San Jose State. And the years had passed in there, a few years. And the, uh, the, I said, well, she thought she would really go home. And I looked at Ted. Ted had a, a car. <laughs> so uh, we took her home. And Helen's mother was still at the dance. Well, that was uh, more, broke more than a little ice. And uh, we, we are more uh, active basis after that, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, we took hikes together, and uh, during that uh, all too, I'd been going to school in San Francisco, and we got acquainted with things up there. And finally, we actually began to go together, I would say, about December 1932. That's from then on, I, I figured about eight months in there. Uh, and then um, in August, or wait a minute, in July, I popped the question, as the saying goes. And the day we set for our wedding day was the day my mother died. And uh, she was the only girl my mother ever approved, <laughs> I think. So uh, we, did you marry we, had, we had to postpone it. That was July 31st, 1932. And did you marry her in San Jose? Uh, we were married in San Jose at my mother-in-law's house by the pastor of her church. And then you had, you had children. Yeah. And and your children are. Well, Jim, uh, Jim was born uh, April the fourteenth, nineteen thirty-five, and Susan September the thirtieth, nineteen thirty-six. Okay. Eighteen months apart. Okay. And no. as, as Henry Bonet or Bonet of the uh, PG&E said to me one day, he said, uh, "How many children do you have, Clyde?" And I said, uh, two. Oh. He said, and that concluded ceremonies? <laughs> <laughs> you may have known him. He was yeah, yeah. an official in PG. Well, you've been active in, in, with historical matters for many decades. In fact, all your life you've been interested in history. In what? In history. You've oh, been yes, interested yes. in history all your life. What, what was your first contact with O'Connor Hospital? 
But would you mind if I said my first contact with the library? All right, we'll start with the library and then go yeah, to the hospital. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, my first contact with the library was my 12th birthday anniversary in uh, 1915. And they, they made the contact with Miss Mary Moha Mullow. And she ran the library. That was upstairs in the old city hall, wasn't it, yeah, at that time? in the 1913 city hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, or Dr. Robertson, they called him. I don't know what he was named he, but any druggist was called a doctor in those days. Was that Luke Robinson? Hmm? Was that Luke Robinson? Uh, I don't really know. It doesn't seem to be that with his first name. Lived he, on Washington Street? Yeah, on Washington Street in a house where Miss Castro lived later. She was a housekeeper, I believe. He was a druggist. Over by Fremont. Yes. Yeah, was that, the, was that Luke? All right. So I, uh, I got to with Mulholland. And she made me write my name, and she gave me a little slip of paper that had to be signed by two taxpayers, preferably businessmen, and they could not be relatives. And when the day that I took that back to her was one of the proudest days of my life, because, boy, I went right into the front porter boys, Tom Swift, Alger, and, well, I was reading Alger at home already. We had a neighbor named Stella Hughes who was giving me books, beginning with the old Chatterbox books. Must have had some effect on <laughs> it. But uh, that's it. And then I had been dealing with librarians ever since. My mother was an omnivorous reader. Well, my Gordon brothers were omnivorous readers, more so than the Arbuckles. Uh, the Arbuckles went in more for the useful arts, we'll say. But, uh, the, uh, but uh, the Gordons were all readers. And I could see mother coming down Washington Street yet, uh, passing Jean Fazer's house passing uh, Fleury's house, J uh, Jenny Walsh's house, you know, uh, all the way down, carrying an armload of books. Passing the old Adorado house, the, uh, the member with the barn with the cupola on it, the house that cost $40,000, and that was money. That's the one that's shown in the Thompson and West book. Yeah, that's it. Yes, yes. And then, of course, we passed the high school in Pete Riley, the town correspondent <laughs> for the Mercury. <laughs> So that was it. That was my uh, and, and uh, uh, that was my great experience. I thought the library was the most wonderful place in the world. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Miss Mulhall one question one time though, when Dreiser brought out his uh, what was the name of that book? If we had such a I for, well, I forgot the name of the book that he read now, for right now. But anyway, I asked Miss Mulhall if she had that book in my library. She looked at me scornfully and said, "I should say knit." Mother, what was that book of Theodore Dreiser brought out? Uh, the book he created such a Theodore Dreiser. He brought a book out about 40 years ago. For, oh, where, where were we on that? Um, I, I don't remember. It, it was a short title, but he created a ruckus all through the literary world. Well, Mary Mulhall was much in control of her library and the books all the time she was there, yeah. wasn't she? And, uh, and then uh, uh, Robinson had to say uh, what books would go into the library and what couldn't. And Miss Mulhall mentioned that uh, Dr. Robinson wouldn't permit that book to come in here. <laughs> oh, you're, you, you, you're engaged in the revolution that must change that order. Yeah, you know, that's right. We were. Yeah. We were. Yeah. So, but uh, that time, too. Now going to the O'Connor. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, my first exposure to O'Connor Sanitarium uh, was a uh, joint. Uh, the, the institution itself, and the name, sanitarium. I said there, there are sanitaria and sanatoria. And there's a slight difference, but not too much. But uh, anyway, uh, mother was visiting a friend who was in the county hospital at that time, a woman, a neighbor woman. And the only way mother could get to the county hospital was to go down, we'd, uh, we'd go down to get the car in Grant Street, Grant and Bellamy, streetcar. Nichols for Santa Fe. We'd ride over to First uh, or to Market in Santa Clara Street, and there we'd get on one of those Bobtail Peninsula uh, railway cars. Once in a while, we'd get one of the big cars, but the, 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 uh, the railroad uh, maintained a local service. And uh, this Bobtail left the town down at the SP Depot in Santa Fe, down Market Street, Market to Park, out Park to Meridian, down Meridian to Stevens Creek, and so on. All right. Uh, the lo the uh, local went just as far as basketball. Well, there was a little uh, uh, switch, passing switch, 
about 100 yards west of Astronaut. And the bomb pilot will be on the west end of that and switch back in and come back into the main line in that block west of uh, Baskerville, but then back to town. And it ran every, oh, about every 15 minutes. The cars on the Alameda were only 10 minutes apart. You had tremendous service on the Alameda. Uh, and, and between Martin Avenue and 10th Street, the cars were only five minutes apart. They had the large ones and the small ones running yeah, in that section. Yeah, the big ones, you know. So uh, anyway, we'd go out there. We'd get off the car at uh, Bascom Avenue and walk southward on the west side of Bascom. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, there was a board walk. Oh, it white as an ordinary cement sidewalk, such as we have in front here. Uh, all the way down there. We'd walk past the Bradley place. I, they call it Beverly Bradley today, or Bradley, uh, and they named after Elisha Lafayette Bradley. He was a mother-in-law of Mrs. Uh, Willis Clayton Sr. I'm a father of Mrs. Clayton Sr. Pardon me, I'm getting my relations twisted. And then uh, we'd walk down to the hospital. And that's when it had the big building with the portico, in front of classical portico. And we go in to visit our, our friend, and uh, then we leave there. Oh, I said that that store was, did I say Mendoza when I was talking to you before Austin got it? It was Oblisolo, or Oblisolo, some people call it. Mendoza had the store on Clay and Main Street. Remember Dingo? Right. Yeah, now we're getting home. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, we'd uh, walk, uh, come back and then we'd go into this store, Oblisalo, I'll, 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 I'll use the pronunciation they use, but I believe Oblisalo is correct. Uh, the, and the, we get some of these little um, raisin crackers, you know, they're flat, about an eighth of an inch thick, with a few raisins in them, about so like crackers, or some graham crackers. And that, we, that was our dessert one, <laughs> going back and forth. And then we'd come all the way back to San Jose, and they come back into town. Then we, uh, we couldn't transfer from that line uh, to um, uh, the Santa Clara side. The Santa Fe Railroad and the Peninsula were separate lines. They had a working agreement, but they were separate lines. That, but they were both owned by, well, Lou Hanchett owned it at that time. Then he sold out to the SP. And then the, but the Peninsula was founded by the SP. The Interurban was founded by the SP. And when they, the two were merged uh, in 1909 as a Peninsula Railway. So, uh, Going out there then, uh, uh, what was your impression of the hospital, the O'Connor Hospital well, uh, at no, that time? We passed O'Connor Hospital on the way out and we saw that big red building with the sandstone trim, which was the trademark of Theodore Lenzen, the architect. And the, uh, it, Where did that come from, that sandstone? Is that, that sandstone from the Goodrich came Quarry? From, you know, it came from out here at Goodrich Quarry. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, everything Lenzen did, uh, the, the Hall of Justice, the old Hall of Justice, was from there. And there, the, uh, the sandstone in the old city hall, uh, the 1887 city hall, uh, we came from there. Uh, the, the, the sandstone from Stanford University came from there for the original club, no buildings. So, anyhow, uh, I got to replace in the sanitarium. Then we looked over to the right side, just opposite uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, O'Connor's, and there was Mrs. Schmeichel, Saratoga Saloon. And over on the other corner was the, uh, at Meridian uh, was the Robertson Grocery, all of which I delivered to years later as a, an employee of the Express Care Company. Then, uh, on the way back, I'd say there was a sanitarium. That was my introduction to the work. Now, that's all I knew about it until I extended, uh, went to work for the Express Company. And when I went to work for Which Express, Express Company was that like? Railway Express. Uh, we, I, when I worked for George Rowe Santa Clara, we were, we were right in the transition, and we were still using up our Wells Fargo and Company stationery. That was in Mr. Whitney's office, uh, right there by... Jack, Jackson and Franklin. Yes, northeast corner. That's where I learned, I learned to drive. Uh, we had a... All right. Now, uh, when I started for the Express Company, I didn't deliver to O'Connor at first. It was out of the city limits. And then the uh, Santa Fe uh, annexed the Hester Hanson district and so on. And that put, uh, and, and, and annexed some of that territory, uh, and that put O'Connor's 
just about, almost by a technicality on our delivery. So I delivered the delivery there. So I was the first one who opened up the delivery counters. So I used to uh, uh, deliver there, and the um, Miss Guidotti, capital G U I D O W T I, uh, was the nurse. She was an RN. She was in the office. She signed all my receipts. Once in a while, one of the sisters would sign my receipts. And then uh, the uh, uh, I was in there the day. Uh, I went in there about half past one one day, and I think I mentioned it. And she said, we had bad news today, Mr. Arbuckle. And I said, well, that Dr. Bayoki died. Do you remember him either? Uh, he had, he sure lived, do. Yeah, he lived on uh, uh, Moore Street, right at the uh, southwest car corner of Morse and Rand Lamb, a beautiful house. Uh, he had, I said, well, well what happened with his son? Well, she said that he'd been duck hunting over on the bay, I believe, and he'd eaten a lot of watercress that was contaminated. Mm. Typhoid. Mm. Uh, I remember that afternoon, but I don't remember the date. And then uh, I, I delivered there right along. And I remember the man that was chaplain at the chapel. I didn't know him. We always bowed to one another. And he would, um, he had a beard, a sort of a dark beard with a lot of gray in it. And I used to see him walking around the premises uh, quite often. And then, of course, the nurse's home then, uh, with, uh, that was one of the great additions to the hospital. I mentioned that in the story that I wrote some years ago, and which you used again this week. And the, uh, I, I'd just pick up and deliver trunks at the nurse's home. But I never had to worry about a thing at O'Connor's there. And I never lost any, delay, any time. Now and then, I'd have to take some object to another part of the building, and that was it. Then, um, getting back to this, they had the stable laid after you was over there, facing out, you went out to the Meridian Road, just about a half a block south of Stevens Creek Road. See, what we now call San Carlos was Stevens Creek Road out there, uh, anywhere beyond the sanitation and limits. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> the, uh, I would handle uh, all kinds of stuff, but, but it just in a business sense. I'd see a doctor, some doctor coming out that I knew. And then uh, my other knowledge of O'Connor's came from Ethel uh, uh, Townsend Bull, a granddaughter of Dr. John Townsend, the first provable American MD to settle. You always say settle, it would be safer, uh, in California. And she told me about the experiences they had there in the early days. She told me about uh, when they were first introduced the X ray. So I, I had all that in my historical knowledge, um, how uh, <coughs> the, the x-ray was a little more than a crook's tube at that time, you know. And uh, a, a Santa Clara boy, whom the papers called Schwartz, and I'll bet his name was Schwartz. I'll bet his name was S-O-A-R-E-S. -E Instead of death, W-A-R-T-Z, you know, the, the confusion of pronunciation, had swallowed a staple and it got lodged in his throat. So there's only one way they can feel it, to get it out. And the, uh, the doctors, um, uh, the doctors uh, used the x-ray. And Ethel Townsend held the boy's neck like this while they held him steady, put it with that hand there. And they x-rayed the extra. Well, it, it was a long time and her hand got burnt. They brought an action in court. And the, uh, they ask uh, uh, how long she, they played the x-ray on the boy's neck. And they said 25 minutes. Got it, 25 seconds today and cooked the whole person, as you know, with any of our stuff today. And well, the... Uh, uh, what, happened to the boy, what happened to the boy's neck? Yeah? What happened to the staple well, on the boy's neck? Uh, I, perhaps I got it. It must have gotten pretty warm. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the case, Might have melted the staple, yeah, huh? The case went to court, and the, uh, she was suing for damages, it seems to me, about $23,000. Well, all the rest of her life, she wore a black mitten-like glove over that deformed hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and she told me about the uh, ex experiments with the, with the x-ray. Dr. Filippella, Dr. Hopkins, and I think there was a doctor from Palo Alto. This is about 1910. I have it on cards in here if you're ever interested. Uh, the, uh, 
And the, uh, then uh, the attorney, I think it was the attorney for the plaintiff, said, this woman has only 29 years to live. 29 years. She can't live any more than that. And uh, when I was at the museum in the late 50s, the early 50s, uh, she gave us, a, we, she, she died then. That was considerably more than 29 years. <laughs> and she gave us a great big uh, uh, album, well, uh, stamps. Uh, she was a stamp collector, appraised at $10,000. Oh my. But there, they, I, I just mentioned in the uh, in my history here the one I gave to you. I have to have an extra one. I gave it to Mary. Uh, the uh, the uh, I happened. To, I just mentioned in passing. Didn't go into any details or any evidence. That I think I may have covered in the chapter on medicine in the big history. Excuse me, Clyde. Let me just check with Ray. How are we doing on time, Ray? Well, we're coming along. Good here. Is there anything further that uh, Clyde can uh, touch on about O'Connor's? I uh, we're we're some of the early phases of. Did you ever uh, meet any of either Amanda or uh, No Miles? I used to deliver to the residents, to the sisters in Notre Dame when they after they took over, when it was known as O'Connor Institute. I when they. The O'Connors gave that. Uh, mm -hmm. The O'Connors gave that building yes. to the sisters of Notre Dame. That's right. You can go into the high school building today and see some of the parquet floor mm -hmm. from the old house. Mm -hmm. At least it was when I, at the time I left my company, uh, it was still there. And I, it seems to me, I went down there to give the girls a talk. One of the sisters called me up and asked me if I would uh, give them a talk on San Jose history. And the, uh, they want, I, I think they wish to hear about the earthquake. Well, I have several hundred slides on the earthquake damage here and in Santa Clara. Uh, and the, uh, uh, I went down there to talk to the girls, uh, one teacher's class, I think. And the, uh, I saw some parquet floors then. I think it was in that cross member of the Ohio. See, that was for orphans or children or under privilege we might say today. Back at the hospital, um, were there some doctors that you met or that you knew about that uh, you well, might like to come I in and practice there in the earlier Underwood, times? J. Underwood Hall, Dr. J. I. Beatty, the father of Hermione and uh, uh, what the other one? Uh, Hermione and lived over on Yvonne. Yvonne lived mm -hmm. over on, in Santa Clara, yeah. at Maine and, uh, yes. uh, and Dr. Street. Beatty uh, held most of the uh, well, uh, by, I guess maybe after the uh, creation of Columbia Hospital in 1923, Dr. Beatty probably split the difference between the appendicitis operations or between O'Connor and that. Well, he and, took my tonsils out at O'Connor Clyde in the 20s, so I remember J.I. very well. Yeah. well did you but know? how about under uh, uh, Dr. Hall? I just knew him by sight. Uh -huh. He uh, had charge of the nursing school there, didn't he? Yeah, well, that I don't that happened uh -huh. to get out of the history. Okay. Yes. And the, uh, let's see, what else was uh, there? I've seen other doctors out there that uh, I recognize as doctors around mm -hmm. town. I don't know whether Dr. Fowler went over there very often. Perhaps he did, but I don't know. But he had uh, his horse and buggy and a sorrow horse named Duke. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Later on, he located over there at Benton and uh, Main Street right. in Dr. Gallup, the dentist's office. Well, you're right. Well, that's the I'll, office that's I'll out here at the park there. now. Mm -hmm. When I got acquainted with Fowler, he was in the old South Carolina Valley Bank building on the southeast corner, uh, where the Bank of uh, Italy took over the bank, you know, and put that marble <laughs> doorway in it. And then he went from there over over Tippy Helms building. They were remodeling the building there, and, uh, and so he went over to uh, Tippy Helms above a uh, real estate office. Charlie South dog bit me right right here. One day, right on your leg, huh? Warren and I, that's when you know, your father at that time, I guess when you were living on Jackson Street about that time. And uh, I went petting the dog. He just turned around, he missed my hand, he caught me there and pinched the devil out of it. So my mother said, well, you better grab Dr. Fowler and look at him. He put me down on the couch right over next to the window, the Main Street window, and then uh, got the, then he looked it over, he rubbed it with a little alcohol, and he said, you can go home now. <laughs> 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 and he, uh, uh, they, uh, a, a, a good 
professional visit in those days cost only a dollar and a half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From there. So then the father moved from there over to the Frank building uh, upstairs. Dr. Menton had his dental office on the east side of the building above Menzel's Harbor. HOF Menton, who had a Stanley Steamer automobile, always late for appointments because he's fixing the Bunsen burner on the Stanley Steamer boiler. And then uh, a flower over, yes, that's where he's going to kick me down the stairs. And then uh, a flower, then he later moved over to Ellis's building, there's the one what they call, what, what that first manager, Smith Ellis. And then and, uh, he had a name there. And then and he just had his name connected with the building in some way. I think, I don't think he was a partner of Fowler's or, and then Fowler moved in there. But there's where I had my first tooth pulled. Dr. Dell uh, had a tooth right up here, and it was wiggling. And it uh, baby tooth, you know. And they, uh, uh, they just seemed that it wouldn't come out. My mother said, uh, you'll have to go to the dentist. And I didn't wish to go to the dentist. And one day she met Dr. Gallup when I was with her. <laughs> and she said, this boy of mine has a loose tooth and it won't come out and I can't get him to go to the dentist. Well, he says, you send him over to me, Mr. I'll, I'll fix him up. He'll be all right. So mother told me to go down there. I walked in the corner door. And then here's a waiting room over here on the right side. And the doctor, Gallup, uh, had his uh, uh, over by the window on the Benton Street side. And he had a patient in the chair. He had his fingers in his patient's mouth when I went in. So he took one finger out and motioned me to one of these old quarter sawed oak chairs. And he said, just sit down there. I'll be with you, young man. Presently, he took both hands out of the patient's mouth, <laughs> reached down there, he got a big pair of tweezers they were about that long with a curl on the end. They weren't forceps. And he said, now he said, open your mouth wide. He hadn't washed his hands or anything in there. Now he said, you can go. And the tooth was gone. Huh? And the tooth was gone. <laughs> but you could, could you imagine if a dentist did that today, he'd be sued. Or they'd sue for everything he ever had. <laughs> then, oh, one patient at that time. Oh, I tell you. But you know, I think of all the good people in Santa Clara, and we have them. And I'm going to defend one. Harry Harper. Everybody said he was a drunk. He was daffy. Uh, after World War I, they said he was shell-shocked in the Spanish-American War. And they called him Daffy Harper. Uh, Harry Harper may have, been a duck, uh, uh, may have been slightly off the line of flight mentally, but I don't think it was. But he was a worker, and he had a widowed mother he took care of. But he was a worker. He was not a bum. A bum would not work. But Harry, it was a mop boy for Walter Davis's Relief Saloon, Bob Goddard's Cricket Saloon, uh, Holy Ghost Perry's a Model Saloon, both, and Taggart's Club Saloon on the south side. Did you have any uh, uh, acquaintanceship with Dr. Sachs? Dr. Chuck? Uh, Sachs. Sachs. Uh, no, no. Uh -huh. uh, How about Dr. Uh, Pritchard? Hmm? Dr. Pritchard. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pritchard, I knew him well, and he, he used to come to see me, he'd be on the program. He was on the fair, uh, fair uh, commission for a while, and every time he'd come there, he'd always come over and say hello, and we'd talk about the olive trees along there by the Oswald Place, around Market Street, the Hoskins living over there, Winslow's living over there, the Wachoses were living where the Winslow house was, and Jimmy Keir over there, and Judge Charlie Thompson in his bridal house, uh, he, he, see, Thompson married, I got the record of his marriage and then clipped and cards, four to six cards on it. And he had, a, he married a woman from up around Cleese, I believe. Oh, beautiful blonde. Well, you remember his daughter, Claire? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so there you were, and Jay Kears lived there, and uh, uh, felt, I know, but Charlie Thompson, he lived in the Green Clabbered House on the south side of Market between Monroe Jack, and then Captain Dunbar uh, lived in the big rambling house on the southwest corner. He was the captain of his own ship. He was the captain of a clipper. And uh, his daughter Florence was born on board the ship in Hong Kong. The first time I ever heard the use of Hong Kong. Uh, just so big. And the captain, Carol Dunbar, I think, is still alive. The younger son, Lester, was with uh, General Mills. He became an official with General Mills. And then Florence 
was a, an accountant in Oakland. She'd come home on weekend. And on the back porch at the uh, Dunbar house, ran north and south, uh, fronting on uh, Jackson Street, there were three huge casks of wine. The Don Captain Dunbar, if you go to uh, Sunshine Fruit and Flowers, published in 1895, owned a big vineyard uh, out at uh, Cupertino. And I met Carol for the first time in 50 or more years uh, at uh, an affair. Cupertino, they uh, married a lion with staging uh, some kind of affair, and uh, Helen and I were guests. And it's the first time I've seen Carol Dunbar in more than 50 years. Oh a great big diplomacy. Uh -huh. But uh, and I, can, I can hear the captain calling him. He wasn't the captain's uh, favorite son. The favorite son was, uh, was Norman Dunbar, who died of San Nazaire during World War I, about her pneumonia, when pneumonia was killing him off like flies. He, he was a, a seaman here, a Navy man. Well, Clyde, we've been reminiscing with you here for quite some time, and we don't want to get you too tired. Mm -hmm. However, maybe could you just give us some thought in terms of your feeling of O'Connor Hospital in its context mm -hmm. as a an agency for health care in the valley. Well, I think I uh, summed it up in that article I wrote, and I think I, 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 Dan, if I may show it to him, uh, I think Dan Cleddy, I, I think I may have summed it up in the last paragraph, and Dan Cleddy uh, used my quotation, he said, I think of something good, and I said, uh, I'd have to get it out there and read it, I'll find it, uh, in uh, uh, easing the pain and relieving the distress or something of the afflicted and suffering. Uh, Miles P. O'Connor, I think, changed the whole concept of remove any fear of the hospital. It, it's in on some of the publications, I'll have to dig it out. And Dan liked it so well, he, he kept using it. Here, I told him about the, uh, the difficult start, what they got, how they, uh, how they uh, uh, lacked uh, modern facilities, how they, uh, <coughs> uh, and in lacking a range, they just had a big stove with pot, pots and kettles on it. And they used those pots and kettles not only for cooking food, but for sterilizing surgical instruments. And uh, I showed him here how uh, little equipment they had. I said, in overcoming such handicaps, however, O'Connor developed. I made that one of the uh, Developed the uh, stamina. They carried through. They carried through two nationwide depressions during the last two k day two decades of the uh, institution's existence. Its status today speaks volumes for the materials and hopes uh, on which the founder and early and their administrators based their security, uh, based their structure, rather. But uh, they, uh, I, uh, This is an article that appeared, that uh, Clyde, in California today under date of April 29, 1973. Mm -hmm. I was just wanting to get that into the record. Mm -hmm. uh, again, glad we do appreciate so much your meeting with us today. And oh, no, I gave that to Mary. Oh, did you? Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, uh, well, no, wait a minute. Francis Fox wrote about the modern hospital. Mm -hmm. and, right. and then I, I, I have an extra copy of that if you need it. Fine. Yeah. The key thing, Clyde, is we do want to thank you for meeting with us today. We probably will want to get some more information from you in due course, but I do know that we have taken a couple of hours of your time this afternoon, and we do thank you for it. Mm -hmm. We know that you've been supportive of the O'Connor 89ers, have been active with it. We're proud to have you as a member of that family, and we're delighted that we could meet with you at your home here today with your wife, Helen, and of course, Ray Silva. Again, we thank you for I'm taking very, part in, and, and filming this wonderful glad, interview. I'm very glad that Mary brought Mr. You brought Mr. Silverly. Glad to meet him. Thank you so much. Yeah. There is a